If you thought 2004 was a loaded year for FPS games, well, it's about to get even crazier. Welcome to Chaos Gaming. Today, we're going to keep it moving, and we are going to count down the 25 best first-person shooters from the year 2005. Now, you let me know which of these you've played. Drop a like, and let's start off with Peria. Yep, a game developed by Digital Extremes. It was a sci-fi shooter set 30 years after mankind almost lost a massive battle with a powerful army of unknown origin. I know that's pretty generic, but the story takes place after this and you explore the world as humanity now lives in various colonies and is trying to understand what happened and how they can prepare for what's next. The story was criticized for being a tad overcomplicated, but the gameplay was pretty solid. Plus, even had a full map editor, which was something I wish more FPS games would have right now. At number 24, Viet Cong 2. This is a tactical shooter released for the PC in late 2005, and yes, it was set during the Vietnam War. You played as an American soldier during the conflict, but once you got to a certain spot in the campaign, you unlocked a second one. It was played from the perspective of a young Viet Cong fighter. Now, Viet Cong 2 got decent enough reviews, and while it wasn't mainstream or anything as a hit, it was still a solid FPS. At number 23 today, Area 51, developed by Midway Games. It was loosely based on the classic arcade game of the same name, but it had a much bigger budget, a more elaborate story, and some pretty impressive visuals for then. The lighting and environments in the game were way ahead of their time, and while the gameplay was pretty standard, it was still a fun way to burn a few hours. And did I mention, Marilyn Manson voiced one of the characters. At number 22, Medal of Honor European Assault. This was when EA was cranking out Medal of Honor games in the mid-2000s, and this is partially what led to the franchise's downfall. European Assault was a solid addition to the series. It had you playing in France, North Africa, Belgium, and the Soviet Union during World War II. It was a good game, don't get me wrong. But a lot of people wrote it off because they were getting burnt out on the Medal of Honor franchise. Everybody has their own idea of which Medal of Honor games are the best, but European Assault, it's pretty good. At number 21, King Kong. Does anybody remember the game? It was based on the Peter Jackson King Kong movie that came out the same year, and interestingly, it wasn't bad. The game swapped between first-person sections where you played as humans trapped on Skull Island and then third-person sections where you played as Kong himself. Now, King Kong was met with good reviews and good sales as it was clear the developers really wanted to bring Peter Jackson's vision to life and they spared no expense, the environments, the sound design, and the epic landscapes. The gameplay was good. King Kong is probably one of the best movie tie-in games of the 2000s and that's saying something to be called a good movie tie-in game. All right, number 20. Call of Chalua? Dark Corners of the Earth? I probably said that wrong. Developed by Head First Productions, published by Bethesda, Dark Corners of the Earth is a horror FPS based off the works of H.P. Lovecraft. He played as a private detective in 1922 who is investigating a strange town that has cut itself off from the rest of the world. The game, it was buggy, okay? And there was no marketing, so it kind of flopped, but it was super unique compared to other horror games at the time, and it's gotten a lot of retroactive praise. Some people even compare it to Amnesia. At number 19 today, Serious Sam 2. Now, believe it or not, Serious Sam 2 actually got criticized for not being serious enough. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> the game is often remembered as one of the more cartoony entries in the series, but in terms of gameplay, it's what you want from a Serious Sam game. Giant hordes of enemies, tons of crazy weapons, lots of blood and guts to add to the spectacle. I really liked the game. I just don't agree with a lot of criticism it got back in the day. Yes, it, it was normal. It didn't do anything special, but if you're a fan of this style of game... You probably got a kick out of it. At number 18 today, Brothers in Arms Earned in Blood. Now, uh, the Brothers in Arms series had a very hot start in 2005. Earned in Blood was released in October. It was a tactical World War II shooter that focused on realism. You had high stakes, emotional storytelling. Running and gunning is heavily discouraged, and it will almost always get you killed. It forced you to take your time and be methodical and really think about your next move. It got great reviews, but it was seen as a slight step backwards from the other 2005 Brother in Arms game, which we'll talk about soon. And yes, they put out two in one year. At number 17 today, Day of Defeat Source. You probably never heard of it. It was a mod for Half-Life back in 98. Then it got a standalone release in 2003, but in 2005, Valve announced they were remaking the game in their own fancy Source engine, similar to what they did with Counter-Strike previously. Day of Defeat was out for the PC. It was a huge success, much like Counter-Strike. I mean, Day of Defeat, it was seen as an all-round improvement over the original game. It kept all the mechanics intact, but it improved the visuals, the gameplay, and the content. And in 2021, people still played on Steam. At number 16, 
Project Snowblind. I mean, Crystal Dynamics had a lot of super underrated games in their library. They did. It was another one. It was released for the PC, PS2, and Xbox in early 2005. You played as a soldier enhanced with nanotechnology as he set out to take down a giant military regime. Levels? They were linear shooting galleries, slower, more methodical moments where you could use your abilities to alter the terrain, stay off the radar. Plus, there was even a multiplayer with this to keep it going. Project Snowblind got good reviews and decent sales, but it wasn't enough to keep the franchise moving forward. At number 15 today, Alien Arena. Now, before anybody yells at me, yes, I know. Alien Arena was first released in beta, released in beta in 2004, but the final version, 2005. Free-to-play FPS, similar to Quake and Unreal Tournament, it featured good visuals, good lighting, a 1960s sci-fi aesthetic, and extremely addicting gameplay. It was called the best free shooter of its time, and it's actually still playable on PC. I know it's not popular now, but if you're bored, go check it out. At number 14, SWAT 4. You remember the SWAT games? This one was released for the PC in early 2005, and it was a highly detailed tactical shooter based on real-world SWAT operations. All your weapons, gear, tactics, they were ripped straight from the SWAT playbook, and the gameplay was tense. The AI was actually good in this, as your teammates were reliable and the enemies were unpredictable, which made the game engaging. It was a good franchise. It was one of the best-reviewed PC shooters of 2005. At number 13, Oddworld Stranger's Wrath. It's an odd world's an odd franchise. Seems like every new game is experimenting with something new, and The Stranger's Wrath is no different. This time around, you played as a bounty hunter trying to earn money for a life-saving operation. The gameplay jumps between third-person action sequences and first-person shootouts, and you track down your target. Then you have the option to kill them, which makes them easier to take in, but it earns you less money. Or you can take them alive, which is a lot harder, but it gives you a bigger reward. It was an odd game. At number 12, Perfect Dark Zero. Now, I know a lot of people who hate this game. But I'm never going to agree with the hate that it gets. I'm not. It was a masterpiece. So obviously it was, I mean, well, Perfect Dark was a masterpiece. So it wasn't going to live up to that standard, but it was good. It was developed by Rare, released as a launch title for the 360. And the story continued where the original game left off. And the gameplay did its best to be a faithful modernization of the classic shooting level design. Multiplayer mode? Underrated. I mean, it wasn't as good as the original, but that's hard to do. At number 11 today, Battlefield 2. This was the first Battlefield game to bring us into the modern era, and it absolutely blew everybody away. It took the framework of Battlefield 1942 in Vietnam, and it brought it to the year 2007. You had this giant war had broken out between the US, Europe, Russia, China, and a fictional coalition of various Middle Eastern countries. DICE went all out with the gameplay here. They cranked out the weapons, the vehicles, everything, tons of detail in the maps, the sound. It was critically acclaimed, and it was one of the best sellers of the year. At number 10. Call of Duty 2 Big Red 1. Now, 2005 was the year we started transitioning to the new consoles, but Activision wanted to make sure the old consoles had some Call of Duty fun. Big Red 1 was a spinoff to COD 2, released for the GameCube, the PS2, and the Xbox as kind of a way to encourage people to go get a new system. But Big Red 1 was actually a good game. It was nearly identical to COD 2, but the story levels were completely different. It kind of served as a side story to the main COD 2 campaign. It was a lot of people's introduction to the Call of Duty franchise. If you still have a copy or an emulator, go for it. At number nine today, Rainbow Six Lockdown. This is often seen as the worst one in the series. Ubisoft made some dramatic changes to the formula. It received less than stellar reviews upon release, but in recent years, yes, people have gone back. They gave it another look. You can judge it on your own. Now, I think it's a good FPS game. It was more linear than previous entries, and there were more cutscenes to emphasize the storytelling. Like I said, it's not exactly a conventional Rainbow Six game, but that's okay. At number eight, Quake 4. I've said before that Quake 4 wasn't exactly a great Quake game, but if you're looking at it as a first-person shooter, it was good. Developed by none other than Raven Software, it launched for the PC, and a few months later, it was a launch title for the Xbox 360. It put a lot of emphasis on the single-player campaign, and it featured high-quality cutscenes and voice acting. And I know the multiplayer was a bit by the numbers, but it was Quake. It was fun. At number seven, Doom 3. Now, Resurrection of Evil was developed by Nerve Software. It served as an expansion to Doom 3 and a mini-sequel to the campaign. It can be played as a standalone game and even, I mean, included tons of classic Doom games. Resurrection of Evil was a great way to expand upon Doom 3's formula and kind of crank up the action as opposed to the slower paced horror game that we got before. It was good. At number six, Fear. Now, one of my favorite games to talk about is Fear, a horror FPS that terrified millions of people. 
You played as an elite group of agents, you tried to contain a paranormal threat, and as you can probably imagine, it didn't go right. The visuals and the sound design and the AI were un- Matched. I mean, the AI interacts with the environments and the enemy play style better than games we get right now. It was terrifying. It was one of a kind. It's kind of a shame the sequels didn't quite hit the level of quality. At number five today, Brothers in Arms Road to Hill 30. Developed by Gearbox, it was the first Brothers in Arms game, to, and it quickly set itself apart from other World War II games on the market. It was a tactical, gritty, immersive game. It didn't shy away from the horrors of war, and today, it's remembered as one of the best World War II shooters ever made in the History Channel, even used it to recreate certain battles for one of their specials. The game was, the game was good. At number four, Call of Duty 2. Now, there's some people out there who still consider this to be the best COD game ever released, and I don't agree with that, but I think it was good. It took the foundation of the original, it cranked it up, better sound effects, better gameplay, better graphics, everything was improved upon release. It was one of the most acclaimed FPS games in a long time. COD 2 was the game that really solidified COD as a mainstay, and then things would get crazier. At number 3, Star Wars Republic Commando, one of the most underappreciated Star Wars games of all time. Tactical shooter set in the Clone Wars, you're an elite group of clone troopers, come on. The game was fantastic, the writing was good, it gave us an early look at the trooper dialogue that the Clone Wars series was later known for. Republic Commando has since been re-released on modern consoles, if you've never played it, give it a shot. It's a top 5 Star Wars game. At number 2 today, Time Splitters Future Perfect. The final game in the Time Splitters franchise. He played as a marine from the 25th century as he went back in time and tried to prevent various catastrophes. It was praised, the gameplay, the presentation. I mean, new features from the first two games. The writing was good. I mean, it was stiff competition in 2005, but it was good. It sucks that the series ended after this one, but it's worth a look. But at number one today, the best FPS game of 2005, hands down, Star Wars Battlefront 2. Many still call this the best Star Wars game ever made, and I can't disagree. Basically took the first game, added even more stuff. More battles, more vehicles, more troops, more heroes, more content. Everything was ramped up, and the end result was a game with virtually endless replay value. It was a giant success, and many people are hoping for a remaster, preferably in the rebooted Battlefront series engine. The 2017, eh, it eventually turned into a solid game, but the 2005 Battlefront 2 will never be beaten. And there you have it, my friends. Next stop, 2006.